Eric and Albert Hong uh, from Deloitte. They're going to share some personal experiences, some of their research, and they're going to talk about something that I'm sure lots of people in the room really, really care about. It's how you can unleash um, the power of your data for next generation people analytics. So, Eric and Albert, over to you. Got the clicker. Clicker? You got the clicker. I don't. Oh, we need a clicker. We need that a clicker. That would be a good thing. Otherwise, we're stuck. There we are. That is the most important thing, isn't Absolutely. it? There we are. There's the clicker. Over to you. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming today. One of the nice things, so I'm, by the way, Eric Lesser. I'm a specialist leader in our workforce analytics practice at Deloitte. Uh, get to work on a whole bunch of really interesting problems with clients uh, around everything from people analytics strategy and operating models and uh, data governance and culture. And so very delighted to be here. Albert? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Albert Hong, and I'm a senior manager in our workforce analytics practice, and I lead our human capital data services team. Glad to be here today. So one of the great things about our roles is we get to talk to a lot of companies and sort of see the evolution of what's been happening in the people analytics space. And, and really over the last, I don't know, three or four years, what we've seen is obviously companies investing in building their people analytics capability. They have, you know, started up a team. They've purchased tools. They have hired smart people like yourselves to run people analytics groups. But what's happened is, is that as they start getting projects up and running and start delivering results to people, they're running into a snag. And what's the snag that they're running into? Their people data. So if we believe, as Clive Humby, who is a British mathematician who back in 2006 said, data is the new oil, people analytics is running into challenges. They're running into challenges with the extraction of that key resource, around the refinement of that key resource, even the delivery, little delivery trucks going round and round. So if we believe that data is the new oil then, how do, how, what can people analytics practitioners do to start to overcome this? So let's talk about some of these problems before we go any further. Um, and I'd just like to get a show of hands here. Um, how many people are still wrestling with, you know, despite all of the work that you've done, that there's still an underlying challenge in the organization that I don't believe this data is correct? Just show of hands. Okay, reasonable number of you still wrestling with this challenge. How about the challenge of being able to integrate the data from different sources? Okay. Next one here. Not having access to the right data to answer the question. You know, we come up with these great hypotheses, um, but uh, give an example. We did some research with about 400 companies, and we asked people, what was the selection criteria? What's the most important selection criteria in choosing your people analytics projects? And we expected to see something like, you know, the ones that could generate the most business value, or which is the one that has the you know potential for strategic intent. Do you know what the number one answer was? The data that we have sitting around was the number one selection point. And then lastly, even if you have the best data in the world, and it's clean, and it's organized, and it's engineered. How many of you still run into the challenge of just helping make the company make the leap from the data to the actual insight? All right. <laughs> so if it makes everybody feel better, you're all running into the same kind of challenges, right? So we could talk about data and its challenges for hours. But the question is, you know, in a... 30-minute session, what do you really need to focus your time and attention to? So we're going to focus on three things today that you as a people analytics leader can do to help foster, at least put a dent into some of these data challenges. 
So what we see in our research and our working with clients are three important areas. So successful people or analytics organizations, they foster a data-centric culture. And this is something that David hit on in his opening session. This idea of how do you not only support the use of data in the organization, but also you know, help data practitioners in, in, to be successful in working with their organizations in creating this data mindset. The second is looking beyond traditional core data. So this is something that a lot of organizations have started to get right, is making that link to core HR data. But how do you start to expand into other areas? How do you start bringing in the business data, the productivity data? How do you start looking not only at your internal data, but your external data? And we're going to talk a little bit more about the value of external data. How do you start building in the qualitative as well as the quantitative? So how do you open up your data aperture? And then lastly, investing in and setting managing data standards. How do you get the quality, the alignment, the timeliness, so that you're not spending your time questioning the data, but actually working with it? So I'm going to start talking about the first one, which is around fostering a data-centric culture. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Albert, who's going to talk about the remaining two issues. So a data-centric culture. Um, just sort of jumping back to our research, um, what we found was is that we, we've run this study on people analytics for a couple of years, uh, going back all the way, I think, to 2017. We did another version in 2020, and then just released another study back in 2000, this year, 2024. And what we found is each and every time when we looked at the maturity level of different organizations, the highest maturity organizations, what's driving it? It is a data-centric culture. The number one factor consistently 2017, 2020, 2024. And what we see is leading organizations almost twice as likely to demonstrate the importance of data-driven decisions. So that when they come to the data, when they're making the decisions that they're actually using the data that exists. And then also they're not only just looking retrospectively, but they're also using data to think about the future, to be able to model their scenarios going ahead in the future. So that's some of the things that are coming out from our research. From our experience, we're seeing sort of five things that data-centric organizations do. So the first one is data is not just being used by senior leaders, but it's built into the fabric of how they are engaging on a day-to-day -day basis. So whether they are conducting a quarterly business review, whether they are launching a new HR service capability, whether they're having a strategy session, they're requiring that data is brought to the table and that there are active discussions about that data. So it's not just an ancillary thing, it's not just another thing to cover, but it's built into the way that decisions are being made on a day-to-day -day basis. The second, the thing that we see a lot of organizations still stuck on is this notion of a single source of truth. And I'm sure you've all been there, but the frustration that comes from different spreadsheets with different assumptions, with different, um, I'll give you an example of one company that we did some work with that had no less than, I don't know, six different calculations from time to, you know, uh, time to close a particular job requisition. And oh, by the way, when you looked at that and untangled it, we simply couldn't put all the assumptions in one spreadsheet because it just took up too much space. The third is business and IT working together on data improvement efforts. Too often what we see is, is this is a white space, that IT thinks that it's the business's responsibility to define the decision rules, the business, the HR organization, thinking that it's IT's responsibility. In one of the clients that we worked with, these were at direct loggerheads, and I'm sure you've seen this in your own organizations. But where we've seen it work successfully is where business and IT have a common agenda in the development of data governance around data engineering standards, 
and being able to have a shared roadmap to improve the quality of the data. Number four, building people analytics skills and capabilities and embedding this into the data, in, into the employee life cycle. Now, I know there was talk earlier about the use of training courses, and training can be important if you're trying to upskill people. But it's got to go beyond training. It's got to be built part and parcel to the role of the HR professional. So just show of hands, if you think about your own job descriptions in your own HR organizations, if you look at the job requisitions that are being posted, how many of them actually have language that talks about data, and analytics? Very few. How many, of the, how many of your organizations, when it comes to performance management of your HR professionals, actually have the demonstration and use of data and the application of data as part of their day-to-day -day role? All of these, so it's not just about having data. It's not about dipping people into the data environment but how do you build it part and parcel into the different job roles, into the job architecture, which you heard about this morning, and how do you make it clear that data is valued through the HR organization? And then lastly, what we see in successful organizations is a willingness to experiment and to provide the psychological safety to try new things to be able to demonstrate new behaviors, to show how data can be used. Not every data product is, project is successful. Not every HR analytics project is going to come up with huge results. But the recognition that you need to do something and be able to learn from those environments and not to be able to shoot people down just because they tried something different. So let me turn the clicker over to my colleague, Albert, who's going to talk a little bit about two of the other areas. Thank you, Eric. So now that we've established the critical role of fostering a data-centric culture, um, it's, it's essential to recognize that, you know, in order to have data-driven decision-making, we need to leverage both internal and external data, which takes us to our next section, beyond HR data. So in this section, we'll dive into how organizations are moving along their people angst journey of not only leveraging traditional HR data sources, but also you know, more comprehensive internal data sources to inform decision making and how addition, you know, they're now considering the additional steps of incorporating external data um, to further their insights and strategic roadmaps. So as I was saying, historically, uh, most organizations have placed a heavy emphasis on leveraging traditional HR data, I think HCM, right? So. That's typically your workplace, workforce, demographics, as well as ex employee experience data. So, you know, these have been instrumental in shaping HR strategies thus far, but we're seeing a natural progression, and it's important to leverage other internal data sources to develop that comprehensive overview of, you know, your HR operations, et cetera. And so you can see some examples on the right here where, you know, incorporating operations and call center data that will give you insight to um, you know, the, the customer experience, the service experience. And this may inform how, you know, how service levels are, are going, as well as potential training needs for your call center staff. Additionally, for your contingent workers, such as your contractors um, and temp staff, um, leveraging that data can provide more insight into your overall workforce composition and also potentially inform um, how to further embed them best to align with the organization's strategies. So you know, many organizations are taking great strides in incorporating and integrating all of these additional data sources, which you know, by the show of hands earlier, we can still see that being a challenge. But we're observing that you know, in order to really understand the full comprehensive picture, um, for data-driven decision-making, it's critical to, critical to include external data. An example that you see on the screen now is external labor market data, or labor market intelligence for this example. Here, this provides the opportunity to better understand hot and emerging skills, hiring employment trends. You know, all these different factors are elements of additional context and insights that aren't available in your current 
internal systems. You know, interesting enough, if the study that Eric mentioned, in 2020, um, we observed that only 22% of organizations were leveraging some aspect of external labor market data. So that's not saying across all those seven, eight dimensions, but maybe in one, maybe in two. Fast forward to four years from now, we're seeing a, a significant uptick in 70 plus percent of organizations trying to embed more external labor market data into their reporting and analytics. So just by a show of hands here, um, how many folks here have started to incorporate external labor market data? Looks relatively close to 60%, 70%, so it's a good start. So to illustrate the tangible benefits of labor market intelligence, I wanted to quickly walk through a case study where a large healthcare system wanted assistance in terms of their employee retention and attraction strategy. Um, this was in response to an announcement that a large competitor was going to be entering their markets in select locations um, and expanding in very similar regions as well as operations. So how did we help them? Um, we were able to leverage external labor market data to not only assess the organization from a workforce and talent strategy perspective, but also compare them against their peers in the industry um, of similar size. Um, and as you can see on the left-hand side, the organization is the second row, um, and we're able to rank them against their peers um, across various elements, such as attrition, wage, um, workforce comp, et cetera, and various demographics. Um, in this particular example, it's, I believe, Chicago and Dallas. Additionally, we were able to supplement this analysis with um, a, a high-level risk assessment to better understand for their high-priority strategic roles, um, how they ranked from a risk perspective, more specifically across wage, um, as well as market risk, et cetera. And both of the combination of the analyses helped inform their future talent strategy, um, particularly for those markets, and better understand which roles would be of highest risk as the competitor was coming into the market. Okay. So now that we've discussed the importance of leveraging both internal and external data, you know, as Eric mentioned previously, there's significant challenges with integrating all the data, but also having that single source of truth as well as trust in the data, which brings us to the next segment, setting the standard for your data. So we all, know, we all understand that to ensure data-driven decision-making, we have to trust the data. And that's why it's very critical to make sure that you not only develop, but also adhere to your robust data governance. And as you can see on the, the pie chart on the left, there's a number of different core disciplines when we think about data governance. Um, and by no means is any of these a single, a, a silver bullet, but the combination of them helps, you know, drive data maturity and trust. And for today's session, we are going to focus on just a quick overview of data quality management, given um, we've observed that there's been a significant uptick in um, focus in this particular area as organizations are trying to respond to the, you know, the surge in AI and Gen AI. Um, typically, data quality, data quality management as well as just data management in general is the initial step towards AI data readiness. So just walking um, the group quickly through um, our, data govern our data quality framework, I um, wanted to just highlight a few areas in terms of what we've noticed has been most helpful for our clients. So our framework focuses on making sure that organizations are not being reactive, but proactive. And so as part of proactive data quality management, um, you know, whenever we're working on a particular data, so data source or scope, we try to focus on you know, not only doing the data profiling in order to better understand the data quality and attributes such as consistency, completeness, accuracy, but we try to devise very, um, you know, particular rules based on business context as well as relevant data documentation to make sure that we can truly understand those deviations from, you know, the business rules and logic. 
But what's most important is, you know, you can always perform root cause analysis and understand how to remediate, but you want to constantly be monitoring your data quality, right? Across the data sources um, and critical fields, what we try to do is implement automated mechanisms to make sure that for those critical fields, you can constantly be monitoring the data quality based on the particular rule set. Additionally, the second part of the automated monitoring is you know, having some sort of dashboard that provides insight into the health of your data sources, as well as you know, double clicks into them, such as the critical fields. This helps not only demonstrate to your leadership that hopefully your data quality is trending in the right direction, but also helps inform your end users or your stakeholders that you can in fact trust my data. You know, we are progressing in the right direction. Our reporting, our analytics, they are reliable. We can actually rely on them to make our strategic decisions. So I wanted to just illustrate the impact of proactive uh, data quality management um, with another use case. Um, we were working with a large tech company that was rapidly expanding. And over the course of the rapid expansion, they had significant hiring. Um, during this time, the HR operations group observed that there were significant uh, data quality issues within their candidate data. And this led to a, a large domino effect across systems, applications, such as, you know, the candidates were not allowed, were not able to start on time, and they weren't getting paid, which is the bigger concern. So how, how do we help um, the organization be proactive in this and also save manual hours? Um, we leveraged SQL scripts in this case to automate the data validation checks. So for those critical fields for a select use case group, we identified the particular rule set for those fields that we should be assessing to identify the output proactively. Additionally, we were able to automate the process where not only can we develop a script to identify the, the deviations, but also send automated emails to the recruiters saying, hey, this appears to be a potential data quality issue. Here are some potential options of what the value should be based on your policies and procedural documentation. Um, additionally, um, we were able to create automated cases so that you know all this was documented and there's paper trails on the back and forth, including the remediation. Um, I think, but most importantly, the proactive data quality management saved the organization a significant amount of time. Previously, they had a data quality control team that was manually assessing and looking for um, these data quality errors within each of the candidates globally. And just within the first month for these three particular use cases, we, we were able to save 200 plus hours in both FTE and vendor hours who were performing this analysis. And I think most importantly as well, for the candidates, we, we were able to assess all the candidate data within a day or within minutes really, versus in the past, it would, they could maybe get through 50 to 60% over a week's time. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Eric. So I said in the beginning of the talk that as people analytics leaders, there are a number of factors that you can help influence when it comes to data. And, and let's, not make, let, uh, let's not make any mistakes. As a people analytics leader, the quality of the data that you are using, that fuel that we talked about earlier, in some ways is a critical success factor whether you're able to do your job or not and how successful you're going to be in your role. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, no matter how impressive your analytic prowess, your ability to draw conclusions, your ability to visualize and make the data come to life, if the underlying data is not of value, you're going to end up in the same position that you started in. So as a data analytics leader, we think there are three things that you can focus on to help be, if you will, to quote someone, an educated consumer um, and to take advantage and, and to make sure that as the chief customer of that data, of that people analytics data, that it's working in service for you. So the first one is, and these are three takeaways that I'd like you to think about you know, as you're moving to your next session, as you're on the plane or the subway home. The first one is, how do you plan 
to foster a data-centric culture? What can you do in your role to promote the importance of data literacy, of the value of data, and if you will, developing or embedding data into the employee life cycle? What can you do in your role to be able to foster and promote that kind of culture? The second is, is you know, what kind of data do you actually need to have an impact in your organization beyond your core HR data? Is it about the external data that we talked about before? Is it bringing in some of the qualitative data that maybe is coming from your employee experience? But thinking about from an investment standpoint, what is the data that you need to be able to solve the problems that are of most value to the organization? Not feeling trapped that it's the data that you can get your hands on, but what's the data that you need to invest in? And then lastly, how do you make sure that you are treating your people data as business data? And that means investing in the tools, the processes, and again, being the end consumer, tracking the quality of that data that you're being used so that ultimately people are not saying, well, I don't believe what I'm seeing, but that I have the trust and the comfort even beyond trust, the visceral comfort that my data is going to be successful. So with that, let me leave you with those three thoughts, and we're happy to take a couple of questions along the way. I think we've, got, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, so maybe any um, questions or observations maybe about um, the findings that, that Eric and Albert have presented? Yep. Jay, you're great for questions. You're a, you're a moderator's dream. <laughs> No, go ahead. Also, I have to apologize to you. You guys didn't hire my kid. Oh, no. <laughs> he asked specifically that I take the screws to the next time I get one. I understood, understood. Uh, so I want to I kind of challenge what you mean by data center. Like, really specifically, what does that mean? Because there's not a leader I know. Oh, yeah, I just go by my gut. I just look at I feel like we're going to go mm -hmm. this direction. So every leader, whether they're HR or not, they will say, I look at the data and the data makes the decision. Mm -hmm. Until it doesn't. Until it doesn't. And so mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand a little bit more about what do you mean by data centric leader, right? Because everybody will say they're the leader. Mm -hmm. It's actually interesting, at least through our experience, we find leaders who are actually questioning that. They're actually saying, you know, we, we still have people who are going, as you said, by instinct and by gut, that they're saying, you know, this is the way we've always done things. But I recognize the fact, when we talk about a data-centric culture, it's about reinventing history. It's how do you get people beyond the, the point where, they're set, where they can point to specific examples that say, the data that I'm using helped me do something more effectively. So you're right, culture itself does not change overnight, but rather it's about what I like to call the rapid reinvention of history, is to give people enough examples or enough pointers to be able to say, yes, this is where we saw an example of the data that countered our experience and it actually works more effectively. The other is also valuing the skill of the data. And again, it goes to the points of, who are the types of people that you're hiring? How are you recognizing people who are coming to the table with this skill and capability? Um, one of the things that we've often talked about, and this is slightly off the topic, but this idea of how do you, um, how do you use more like a project management or program management approach to improving your data. So how do you build this rather than just saying, okay, here's a bunch of projects, but how do you systemically attack these kinds of data errors? So there are lots of interventions that you can take place that ultimately sort of rise up into, you know, we've now valued data as that new oil and as a resource. So just some examples of ways that you can sort of build that up. Other questions? Yes, we've got another one. They've got two here, actually. So we'll come to the front and then two rows back. 
Hi, uh, John Carmichael from Trinet. I'd love to hear a little bit more uh, the advice you'd give for companies to be successful, keying off of what you said where uh, you want to be the chief customer of the data. Mm -hmm. um, there's been many challenges that I've seen and heard from others where you either end up starting to own and having to invest effort into setting those standards, which takes resource away from primary activity, mm -hmm. or um, it, it gets lost in the pool of prioritization with many other functions mm -hmm. also wanting data standards. And so you said that chief customer, and I'd mm -hmm. really love to see or hear more about how you can set yourself up successfully in that way. A couple of thoughts just right off the bat. Um, you know, like any good development organizations, it's about co-creation and co-creation with your other stakeholders. So it's not just your responsibility, even though you feel like you need to take it on sometimes because otherwise you can't be successful. But how do you bring together all the relevant stakeholders who need or have a stake in, um, in the data and the data quality? So whether it be IT, finance, uh, regulatory and compliance and legal, um, it's how do you make sure maybe you are the convener of bringing all of those stakeholders to the table to make sure that it doesn't fall off that agenda. So you may not be the complete owner of the data. And many people analytics organizations that we work with are not the owners of that data. They actually are the recipients of that data, but they can also serve as the convener of the bringing together of those various groups and to provide the structure so that what they're getting is what they need. I mean, the only thing I'd add is, like, depending on the organization's maturity, right? Oftentimes, we would recommend or advise that, you know, enterprise data governance has their standard, right? And those should be um, assessed from a HR people analytics perspective to see how they, you know, fit within HR and, you know, may also need to be further adapted or, um, appended to per se, right? So, but in terms of for, if there's organizations that aren't as mature, let's say, and don't have an enterprise data governance function or standards, it's how can I take incremental steps um, across some of those core disciplines to move the needle? Just one thing to with. add, has anybody been involved in any enterprise data governance or data quality types of initiatives? Has HR ever gone first? <laughs> oh, there is an example over there, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we got, else? I think there's a question here yeah. from Law. Yeah, I'm curious if your report or your research in 2024, if there was any mention of Gen AI or AI or co-pilots and how your clients or mm -hmm. companies are leveraging or some of the pitfalls they're trying to avoid. Our data sample, I can tell you right off the bat, came out a month before JAT GPD, the, the, going, the data going out to the environment. So we, for that specifically, we just kind of missed our window when it came to that, you know, the full disclosure. Um, but does I think that take away the message in terms of data quality? No, I think it just even further doubles down on those kinds of issues because of the ubiquity and the, easy, the ease of which it is to propagate mistakes I don't think Gen AI actually, you know, takes away from anything that we've talked about. It just makes it even more important and more insightful. Yes. Yep. Um, have you run across anybody who's tried to use um, external market data to do a financial statement that subtracts employee cost at market rather than actual pay? So you get an employee value added number and then can compare that with investor value added? That's an interesting question. I've never seen it. Um, but one of the things that we do see organizations paying much more attention to is not just from a benchmarking standpoint, but looking at external labor data from a uh, competitive insights perspective. What are my competitors actually hiring for? You know, all of a sudden, someone comes into my market and they're looking for skills that perhaps never thought of those skills before. Maybe this is a competitive move into a new line of business for them. Maybe it's a distraction for them. But what we often see is a lot of the external labor market data, I mean, it, in the talent acquisition space, this has been around for a while. 
But what we see and what we think is important with the external labor market data is that has implications for talent management organizations. It has uh, implications for strategic planning organizations, uh, cost and location, real estate. Um, so there are becoming more and more use cases around this external labor market data. Looking at that kind of financial value might be another one. I don't think we've run across it yet, but thank you. I think the closest I've seen is a life sciences healthcare company wanted to assess very specific roles that had, let's say, certain certifications just for the ease of conversation. They realized that there's a similar certification with corresponding skill sets that is at a significant the cheaper cost. So they were trying to understand within which markets do these individuals exist for the potential to transition the hiring over to them, given that they had such high attrition in general for those roles. Um, but going back to your the AI question, specifically for external labor market data, we've been doing quite a bit of work um, helping organizations understand AI skills tied to the AI rules, right? And helping them understand where are they going? Like, where are their AI practitioners going? Are they going to their competitors? Are they going to other industries? And what's the inflow back into their company as well? Are they coming from similar industries, other industries, what roles, et cetera? So. All right, I think we have time maybe, we, for, do we have time for one more? We don't, we've We're literally right just time. got into right. the red, Eric, and okay. I know that there's a panel, so there's gonna be some like removal so people coming. Significant transition here, okay. Significant transition, but, a big round of applause for Albert and Eric. Thank you. Thank you.